Hi everybody, thank you for coming to our communication, no, our community forum uh, for 2019. Um, just by a raise of hand, I just, I'm interested uh, for our community members, how did you hear about this this evening? How many of you received the email that we send out? Okay, and how many people saw it on Facebook? And snail mail, the postcard. Perfect. All right, glad to see that it's working. Um, so uh, we'll kick this evening off um, by introducing uh, Joe Sargitakis, our Board of Trustees member, and thank him for uh, letting us have this meeting tonight. So thank you all. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Uh, good evening. Thanks, everyone, for taking their time out to uh, hear this presentation. I think you'll be pleased in, in uh, what you're going to be hearing tonight. Um, we're going to start out tonight with Chris Nelson, who's uh, our communication specialist. Thanks again. All right, so we see some familiar faces, but also some new faces. So we chose the big room tonight as opposed to the, the smaller room. So for those, who's, who's the first time to one of our community meetings? All right, that's what we like to see. Um, I, I joke, I've been in this job just under two years, and we've had the same kind of six people always come. And so it's exciting to get, get some new, fresh faces. Um, I want to more formally introduce Sean. Uh, Sean Wood is a communication specialist. For the last year, he's been doing our community outreach. So Sean is the friendly voice that the neighbors call when we do something that uh, may or may not irritate you around the university. So I do want to publicly thank Sean. He does a really great job. Um, and, and again, he, he's, he's at first point of contact. So if you do see an issue, if you've got a question, uh, Sean is the guy to call and he'll track that information down because the university, as all of you know, is a big, big organization, a lot of different points of entry. So we wanted to put Sean in that position to try to make this as easy as possible. Um, I'm often asked, you know, is the university getting the word out enough? And so uh, we, we generate a lot of news, some of it good, some of it not so good. We try to make it all good. But a couple of these in briefs, if you're interested, um, uh, just kind of the, the last quarter highlights from the last two quarters. I'd also direct you to unews. Uh, dot utah dot edu and then at the u at the letter u and then utah dot edu these are our two content platforms and so we would love to um if, if you want to know what's going on at the university of utah those are our two places to get that information and then sean can also get you subscribed to our our neighbor newsletter as well so thanks for those together sean and then also thank you to joe and the board of trustees the, the board of trustees is kind of the official host of our annual meetings um and so we appreciate joe's involvement in taking the feedback back uh, the other announcement that we are going to roll out tonight is uh, we've been doing these three times a year. What we've decided is to do uh, university policy requires one a year, which we do in January, and we will look at doing another one in the fall, and then our third one will kind of become the summer barbecue. So that same email list and mailing list uh, that we sent to all of you tonight, we invite you to join us this June up in the Fort Douglas area. Uh, we'll have you know, dinner and food, but again, just our connection to, to making sure that we're listening to our neighbors in the community. And so this is my favorite one. I'm really excited that the entire university administration is here tonight. So uh, it's great to see all these folks here. And we also have representatives, I noticed, from uh, the Huntsman Cancer Institute here. We've got folks from our facilities group, uh, folks from our healthcare system, uh, folks from our property management. So a lot of university resources here tonight if you've got questions. And so the rest of the agenda tonight is uh, President Watkins will, will speak and present an overview of the university. And then she's joined by uh, our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, also our Provost, Dan Reed, Dr. Dan Reed, and then our Senior Vice President for Health Sciences and CEO of University of Utah Health, uh, Dr. Mike Good. So my proposal is President Watkins, Dr. Reed, and then Dr. Good. Great. So with that, I'll turn it over to President Thank Ruth Watkins. Thank you so much, Chris. And let me express my thanks to all of you for being here. Tell me how the sound is. Can you hear all right? OK. If it's not loud enough, let me know. I really appreciate that you would take the time to join us tonight. Uh, the university is very interested in being a good neighbor, and the university is an important part of the health and vibrancy of our community. So thank you for helping us do that well and taking the time to come out and be with us tonight. I would also all mention that uh, we have a colleague from athletics here as well. Chris did not mention athletics, but I want you to know that. I think athletics is an important part of the neighborhood as well. So um, I wanted to start with just a brief word about safety on campus and around campus. Um, you, I'm sure, are aware that we had a very tragic death on our campus, a murder of one of our students, which is a terribly sad thing that happened in October. And what I wanted to mention briefly is the many efforts underway at the university to address safety and security, 
to improve our practices, to address some of the weaknesses that have been identified. And I wanted you to know that we are taking that very, very seriously. Uh, you may know that we had an independent review that recommended 30 actions. The university is enacting every one of those actions uh, with individuals assigned who are responsible and being held accountable for implementing those changes. So I just wanted to start with that because it has been, I think, a very, uh, very sad and serious event on our campus. And I want you to know as our neighbors that we are taking it very seriously and implementing those actions as we go forward. Okay, so now this is a participatory evening, so get ready. I would like to ask you to think about points of pride that you have in your university. Are there things that have happened at the, your university in the past few years that, are, that you are particularly proud of? Anything that really stands out to you, things that have been accomplished, things that have happened, things that you've observed that you could say are points of pride to you as a member of our community and our university community uh, in terms of things you're proud of. It always takes that brave soul to get us started. Yes, thank you. Um, ah, yes. Focus on our carbon footprint, working towards our carbon neutrality goal in 2050. The efforts that the university has made to build more sustainable buildings, to think about energy, to utilize resources more efficiently. Excellent, I'm proud of that too. What else? Anything else? Other things, yes. <clears throat> ah, yeah. Yeah, so the points are the OSHA program, which is lifelong learning opportunities to connect uh, with people back to the university for classes of interest in education and learning and community building a very vibrant program on our campus, and then our investment in beautiful new buildings like this. Um, we know that to remain competitive, to attract the best people, faculty, students, and staff, we need to modernize our facilities. And thank you, that's a great point. Other points of pride in your university? Yes, Suzanne. Ah. Yeah. So I think this is very nice for people in our uh, facilities and campus area to hear that. I would agree completely. The point is the university has made thoughtful investments in our landscaping and environment, thinking about uh, con conserving water, about using resources wisely while maintaining a beautiful campus which is important for well-being and, again, important for keeping and attracting the best people. Very good. A couple others. Other things you're proud of in your university? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Excellent point. So this is your university as citizens of Utah, and our opportunity to bring interesting, provocative, talented people to campus and open the doors of the university to the community, very powerful and very important part of what we do. Thank you for noticing that and for being a part of it and taking advantage of it. Yeah, Jonathan. And then, oh. Yes. Yes, I think our efforts to be a more bike-friendly campus are beginning to pay off, and we see that happening around us. I think more attention to bike lanes and bike traffic, very important. Uh, I, uh, many of us who are on campus noticed last summer one day uh, scooters arrived on campus, literally in a day. They just appeared kind of out of nowhere, and that has created a few challenges. Um, it has some upside, too, in terms of... Um, more environmentally friendly travel. It's a, it's a very strange thing to watch that sweep through a community, um, but the bike efforts, very, very excellent. Yeah, Jonathan, what were you gonna say? Uh, very excited. Ah, yes. Yeah, so for many people, athletics is a huge point of pride for the university. Uh, the expansion of teams for many different sports to participate. When is the first lacrosse mat? It's coming. 
February 1. That's hard to believe. Yeah, what if we just don't understand it? We want to look, I mean, lacrosse? I don't understand a lot of these moves. Uh, lacrosse tutorials will be provided. I think my colleague Laura Snow is a lacrosse expert. So there you go. Um, I think um, the opportunity to attend, watch, and participate. I believe the first matches are going to be held at Judge. Do I recall? No. In Rice Cycles. Okay. Is it an NCAA sport? Yes. Yes. Men's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and of course, sports are a very important way that the university and the community connect. And that is a, a very important part of what we do. Maybe one or two more. Yes. Student Life Center, how about it? Sports for everyone, right? Physical health, well-being, activity, a beautiful, beautiful state-of-the-art facility. We are very proud of that, too. And our students, when you do campus tours and students walk into the Student Life Center, it's a good deal closer for getting people to come to the U. Anything else? Yes, Joe. Yes. So take note of that point because your university is moving up in um, the most important work we do, attracting talented students and making sure that they stay through their degrees. I will also say your university is moving up in its research profile. Very stunning progress in the last few years, taking our place on the national stage as a powerful preeminent research university, as we should do. And I hope that you're proud of that, too, because that is important for the citizens of Utah. I'm going to zip through just a couple things that we're proud of at the university and then turn to my colleagues for uh, some comments in their areas of academic affairs and health sciences. Okay, there's that graduation rate number. I want you to take note of the fact that moving your graduation rate up 10 percentage points in a five-year period is pretty remarkable. That's the number of people who come in the door and leave with the degree they came for. We hope that trajectory continues right on. That is what a flagship research university must do. It's important to everyone who has an investment in this institution. Research dollars. Research dollars give you a sense of our competitiveness on a national scale. They let our researchers do the work that they need to do to address issues like cancer, the environment and clean air, to advance in new energy solutions. Research dollars are critical to make that work happen. Five years ago, $388 million a year. This last year, $515 million of research funding at this university. That is a remarkable trajectory. We should all celebrate and be proud. Those are dollars that go towards solutions to real problems of Utahns. We hope that trajectory continues. We have an excellent faculty. There are people here who I think have been on our faculty in the past. Um, we are successfully competing for great people, and they are being recognized with major prizes and awards at the national level. Uh, very something we should all be proud of. Now I'm going to take a little different turn. This is the Wellness Bus. The Wellness Bus is an initiative made possible by the Miller Family Foundation and it is focused on diabetes, driving out diabetes. The, this is a very critical health problem in our society. There are many Utahns impacted negatively by diabetes. There are also many Utahns who don't know that they have diabetes, that are not getting the treatment that they should. The Wellness Bus is designed to take education and care to people in their neighborhoods to make it easier for people to access care, and it's also designed to help us do research on the types of treatments and interventions that will help more people. This is a remarkable example of what we like to say that we are very proud of our status as the University of Utah, but we're just as proud of our role as the University for Utah. The Wellness Bus is a good example of that. This is another example of that, the Pacific Islands Studies Initiative. This is a project funded by the Mellon Foundation. The state of Utah has the largest population of Pacific Islanders in the continental U.S. We have very little in terms of research, community, and education that pertains to Pacific Islanders. That is happening at the U. This is uh, Hokulani Aiku, one of our faculty members who is leading this initiative to help us develop knowledge and engage the Pacific Islander community in the university. Again, the university for Utah. 
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about another theme that I'm very proud of and I hope you are too, and that is value. So when we look at universities and the educational component as well as the healthcare component, we can look at a continuum of most and least affordable. How much does it cost? We can also look at a continuum of good and bad outcomes, best outcomes and worst outcomes. Value is not what you pay. Value is what you get for what you pay. And the University of Utah offers remarkable value. I hope you're proud of that, and I hope you tell people that. I'll show you some examples. These are several states distributed along the healthcare continuum. And what you will see is Utah has a very healthy population with good health outcomes with relatively low annual spending, in fact, among the lowest in the nation. That's value in what we do. And the interesting thing is, the same thing is true in education. Utah has positive outcomes in terms of adults with degrees and very affordable tuition. So that intersection of cost and quality, value, is something the university is proud of. We want very much to maintain this and to be a leader going forward. As an educational institution, as a full academic medical center that offers high quality at reasonable cost, that keeps healthcare accessible, that keeps higher education accessible for our stakeholders. That's an important pride, a point of pride for us in our university. Um, this is now being recognized. The Wall Street Journal just produced a survey that ranked the U 11th as a best value institution. That's very powerful on a national stage. I think I'm proud of that, and I want to be sure that we maintain that. I'd love that to be top 10. That's our goal as we go to the next phase. Now, as we think about one more dimension that we're proud of, um, these are folks from our healthcare uh, system, our healthcare leader. We see Dr. Good there. Um, the U has been recognized for a long time as offering the, an exceptional patient experience. In fact, the U has been ranked top 10 in quality for nine years in a row in terms of quality patient care and the patient experience. Can you imagine? Top 10. This is your own university, your own neighbor uh, with such prominence. Do you know the only other institution that has been top 10 for nine years in a row? Any guesses besides the U? Mm, who could that be? So quiet. You'll have to tell them, Mike. Mayo. Mayo Clinic. Now, this is good company for the U. Did you know that about your next-door neighbor in our academic health center, in our hospitals and clinics? This is remarkable. We are striving to make sure that that exceptional experience also pertains to our students and the educational experience they receive. This is a group of people called Student Success Advocates. They proactively reach out to students to help them succeed. They won an award on the national stage for the work they do. Again, focusing on an exceptional experience, this time for our students, in addition to for our patients and our, uh, those who in, are involved. This is a student named Dinesh. He lives at Lasand, and he is a student director of the MAKE program and also pursuing sustainability um, in his studies. The opportunity to live and learn in beautiful spaces like the Lasand Institute um, very much important for the success of our students and for offering that kind of interactive experience that raises the quality of an exceptional experience. Uh, a quick statistic, I believe this is last year's freshman class, and we have just participated in a survey that tell us 90% of U of U students say they've had an exceptional experience, that they would come back if they were going to do it again, versus 86% among our peers. So we know that we're be we're seeing this progress of what we do and the experience our students have being exceptional. Okay, one last thing I want to talk about before I turn over to my colleagues, and this is what we call One U. There are only a handful of big universities in the country that have a comprehensive university and a comprehensive academic medical center on the same physical footprint that share a campus together. There's about 20, maybe 25. That's a big deal. We're proud of that, and we also know that we need to capitalize on it. We can do things here at the U because we are one U that many of our peers cannot do. 
full health system, academic medicine, comprehensive research university, and everything that goes with that, that's kind of a big deal. It should be a big deal to the citizens of our state, and I know it pays dividends for all of us because we can work together. These are two faculty scholars, one from otolaryngology, the other from family and consumer studies, who have worked together to develop infant screening, hearing screening and identification of infant hearing problems that could only happen because these kind of people are able to work together here in this institution. It's exciting for us. Now, we're going to take a small pause and watch a brief video about research at the university. So, I want you to set the stage just a little bit. Remember that statistic that we looked at at the beginning? Five years ago, $388 million flowing into the state, into the U, to, to drive research. This last year, $515 million. That's big growth. What's happening with those research dollars, and what kind of things are we accomplishing? This will tell you a little bit about that. Well, this has been an incredible year and an unimaginable year in regards to research, and we couldn't have done any of it without everything that's come before us. History and experience really kind of informs what you do today, where you need to go, and it's a platform for success. It's also important for us and reasons to come here and reasons to stay. Since our inception in 1850, with our original charter to advance fine arts and science, we've just been outstanding in research across all avenues and venues. All of these are just remarkable achievements that span a unique history and a diverse history that has really positioned us for what we are today and all of our successes. So we have this great history. We're in this perfect place right now, but I actually think we're also on an upward trajectory. By all accounts and by all indicators, we're gonna to continue to grow because we're all striving for excellence. We've seen a significant increase in both federal and industrial and foundational research as evidenced by over $500 million in research funding. We've also seen a remarkable increase in our number of publications, book chapters, and citations. And all of this is a testament to our investigators, their staff, and their students who contribute to research excellence at the University of Utah. These accomplishments are due to multiple factors, including our desire to innovate and discover and our tremendous faculty, students, and staff who want to work together to advance research. And now we have a new champion, our president, Ruth Watkins. She knows that research distinguishes us, and she knows how important it is across the entire university. And if you think about one university and you think about bringing us together and advancing us, it's really research that can lead that charge. One of the themes that is most impressive about the University of Utah is the genuine commitment to solving big problems, to doing work that matters to society. And I would say a second really impressive feature is our spirit of collaboration and the collective good. I have seen remarkable efforts of partnership, of reaching across boundaries that will truly provide cutting edge research opportunities. You know, when you have success like that in, in regards to awards and book chapters that, and papers that you publish, people get excited. But a lot of it's because it's interdisciplinary, because it's between different groups across campus, within the health science and main campus. And so I think that the team approach, which is really the University of Utah, kind of the one you approach, is why people are excited right now. You know, it's our history, it's our outstanding accomplishments today, and it's our future. And those are kind of the why we're celebrating.
I want to say thank you to all of our researchers, our, our students, our staff, our faculty. It's all of your hard work and your commitment that has gotten us where we are today. Warmest congratulations to our research community. The progress we have made in our research enterprise is truly remarkable. An incredible year of success. That success shows the value, the importance, and the impact of the work of our researchers. When we look at the University of Utah, our unique strengths are our comprehensive excellence. The breadth that we have as an institution with an academic medical center, a comprehensive campus, sharing the same physical footprint. As one you, we can achieve anything. So I would like to say thank you. As our community neighbors and partners, uh, we hope that you're as proud of the university as we are and that we wanted you to have a chance to know something about these kind of achievements. Now, I'm gonna pass to my colleagues who are both new. Um, both, of us joined, both of them joined us this summer. Uh, Dr. Reed, July 1st, and Dr. Good, August 1st. So really very new to our community. And this is a good chance, I think they're going to make some informal comments and a chance for you to get to know them. So we'll start with Dan Reed, our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. He joined us from the University of Iowa and we are thrilled he's here. Thanks, uh, and I'm delighted to be here uh, to meet with you. I thought I'd start by maybe just giving you a very brief synopsis of who I am. Um, I uh, came here immediately before this from the University of Iowa. I was the Vice President for Research and Economic Development there. Before that, I was a Corporate Officer at Microsoft. Uh, I was a VP for Global Technology Policy. So I spent a lot of time traveling the world talking to governments about the future and how technology was reshaping our world. But I spent most of my career at the University of Illinois. Uh, I'm a uh, computer scientist by training. In fact, I'm about as old as you can get and actually have computer science degrees. Um, so, um, and uh, that was longer ago than I would care to admit, perhaps right now. Um, but I want to pick up on a few things that President Watkins said, and I suspect that Dr. Good will as well. Uh, and that's really the one Utah theme. Uh, people often ask me uh, why I came here, uh, and you just heard some of the reasons why I did. This is a university that's on the rise by almost any metric you can think about applying, from the quality of its physical plant to the success of our students to the quality of our faculty, uh, and it really is part of that one Utah ethos. Uh, someone asked me what that meant, and I said, Think about it this way. We have roughly $4 billion of expenditures that describe the university, thousands of intellectual assets. How do we take those capabilities and build a better world? That's the business we're in. In fact, as I was meeting with the Utah Presents Board in Kingsbury Hall this morning, uh, I started by saying, think about the role of a university particularly a great public university, and every one of those adjectives matter. We're an emporium for dreams, and what I mean by that is the hopes of parents and the dreams of children, the aspirations of our faculty to create new knowledge and also to transmit it to new generations, and how we engage you, the community locally, regionally, statewide and ultimately nationally and internationally, we are the reservoir of the arc of history. We preserve knowledge from really the beginning of civilization and we transmit it to future generations, but we successively add pieces to that great mosaic. Uh, and we do that not only in the laboratory, uh, in the theater, in creative arts, but we do it by the way we engage and affect society. 
And so it's really important occasionally to step back and think about what we do beyond just the, the seeming prosaic processes. We really fulfill a function in society that is unique. And I said at the outset that every one of the adjectives of great public and research are important and distinguishing. The great, you've heard some of the numbers. The research, we create knowledge. The public, we have a societal trust, which is why we're here talking to you tonight. And university, of all the things that that means. But with that backdrop, I would have just mentioned a few things. And I must say, President Watkins is always a tough act to follow. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a few things that are in flight uh, that uh, are underway since I've arrived here. President Watkins talked about continuing to raise our profile in research and scholarship, but also how we think about continuing to broaden access and the success of our student body, the fact that our graduation rates have risen demonstrably. Uh, I've assembled a broad-based task force across campus to look at how we continue to drive forward student success how we raise graduation rates, how we broaden access and increase the diversity of our student body, reflecting both the growing population of Utah, but also its growing diversity, and recognizing that with that growth and with that rising diversity, there are new challenges. Uh, and there are many, uh, and they are distinct for each subset of the population. How do we think about responding to those needs and ensuring those students are successful? So the diversity, the success of students, what are the implications of that for how we think about delivering educational programs, how we think about supporting those students and ensuring the, their success. And there are a few things to think about in, in that context about student success and outcomes are really a, a lot of, as I said, those, those support mechanisms. Um, there are other things that I, I just wanted to briefly mention. I talked about the, the Great Public and the Dreams Emporium. Here are a couple concrete things you should know. We're deep in the midst of a search for a new director for the Pioneer Theater. Um, we are searching for some new deans of the academic programs, uh, the dean of the College of Science uh, and the dean of the College of Law. There are law uh, dean candidates on campus today, in fact. And so both of those searches are moving forward, uh, and I hope to see outcomes of those soon. Uh, uh, President Watkins talked about the economic effects of the university. One of the other initiatives we launched is a much more direct quantification of the economic impact of research and scholarship. And there are many axes of that. One are the direct expenditures, which include employing faculty, staff, and students in the purchase of supplies. But the research enterprise is also an economic engine in the way that it creates new jobs, creates new companies beyond the direct exposures. We're working to quantify that so we can deliver reports to the legislature and share with you about how we see both the direct and the indirect impacts of the university uh, on our economy. And just a couple other brief things uh, in passing that I'll mention. Uh, related to student success, I would be remiss if I didn't mention something that we announced today, uh, which is a new and novel method to ensuring student success with student financing, the income share agreement. One of the great challenges that students have is getting over that final hurdle uh, and finishing the degree. Uh, often because of financial limitations. And so this is a model that's not loan-based, neither is it scholarship-based, though that's a piece of the story. But the model says that uh, if you're in targeted programs of opportunity, uh, we will ensure that you graduate. In, in other words, we'll cover your tuition. And in exchange, you commit to returning a nominal percentage of your future income uh, as part of the repayment. It's a pay-it-forward model, self-sustaining with the notion that the returns from that would be used to invest in future generations of students. And we're, one of the things that I would describe that as a part of is the student future success is looking at experiments that respond to the changing needs of our student body. And here's one way to think about that. In university circles, we often talk about traditional students and that model really is one. I graduated from high school. My parents are supporting my college education fully. 
perhaps with some degree of financial aid, but I'm a single student, I'm going to school, I'm going to graduate in four to six years, and I'll go off into, into the private sector and work. Those are a minority of our students today. We have often call those the traditional students. The non-traditional students are the majority of college-going students across the U.S., which is to say they're either self-supporting in whole or part, uh, they may or may not be married, they may or may not be have, have children, but they are independent entities not fully supported by their parents. That puts, as you would expect, a whole different set of social strains on those students, uh, perhaps supporting a family, managing uh, all of the economics of, of an independent life, different sort of world than many of us lived in. And that's part of why these experiments about how we provide different models of economics are really important, because the nature of our student body is changing. And we, in turn, as agents of society, have to be thoughtful about how we respond to that. So the thing I want you to take away from my experience in the seven months I've been here is, this is a place on the rise that was part of what attracted me here. I see an amazingly positive future for this place, its impact on the city and the region, and I'm really excited to be here, both in partnership with President Watkins uh, and in, pre in partnership uh, with Mike Good. He and I spend a lot of time talking together about these complex issues and about One Utah and how we can work together to address them. Because as President Watkins alluded and as you saw in the video, there are very few issues that, are narrow, that have narrowly focused solutions. Almost everything involves the confluence of multiple forces and requires us to look through it often a lens of health care or technology or science, but also social behavior, economics, policy. And the thing that a great public research university does is it brings all those assets together. That really is the vision and the opportunity of One Utah. And with that, let me turn the microphone over to my colleague. Thank you, Dan, and thank you all for being here tonight. And, and hello to my neighbors. Uh, Danette and I have moved into Federal Heights, and we've met a few of you, and we have a lot more uh, uh, to meet as well. But also to the broader Salt Lake City uh, community and, and, uh, and in fact, uh, the whole state of Utah. Um, a little bit about my background, kind of three big chapters. Uh, I was born and raised in Michigan. I went to medical school at Michigan and got interested in anesthesiology um, and uh, got into the anesthesia training program at Florida. Um, I told my wife we'd just go with me there for three years and we'll move back to Michigan. And this summer we moved away from Florida after 34 years there. So she does call me a liar, but the rest of the stuff I guess I do pretty well. <laughs> so we get to Florida. In the early part of my career, uh, got focused on improving ways of learning, and to make a long story short, got the idea to build a patient simulator. Rather than having the, the training anesthesiologists learn, there is a role in, for learning uh, on real patients, but could we also accelerate a lot of that with patient simulators? I was fortunate to be at a university that had a very strong engineering uh, 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 campus, engineering college. In fact, it was three doors down. And that was an important lesson for me, and I'll, I'll come back to it, about this interface we talk about uh, between the disciplines. So chapter one was kind of inventing the patient simulator. Uh, chapter two, I spent nine years leading a VA healthcare system. Um, uh, I was very proud to help care for America's veterans, um, but also uh, the VA healthcare system is a very good healthcare system. Uh, I think often underestimated and offered, often underrespected for the great care. And I'm very pleased we have a great affiliation uh, with our VA healthcare system here. And the, for the past 10 years, I was dean of the medical school uh, at the University of Florida uh, and was uh, pleased to lead uh, the, uh, all of our missions. And I guess that's the second point I want to make is um, I'm a mission-driven person, and we are a mission-driven organization. In the health sciences, um, uh, delivering world-class patient care, educating the next generation of health professionals, conducting the important uh, research uh, that you've heard about, and community engagement. The reason we pursue excellence in those missions is the engagement with our community, both locally uh, and nationally. And as you've heard, as we try to solve some very challenging problems of our time, 
Uh, just to reiterate, uh, President Watkins refers to one university. Um, I, I fill it in a little bit. University Integrated Academic Health Science Center. This notion of the health sciences, the medicine, nursing, pharmacy, health, dentistry, all together with our university hospitals and clinics and with our 1,400 physician strong uh, faculty practice, all co-located on the same university um, and under common, governments, co common governance. As Dr. Watkins uh, correctly pointed out, no more than two dozen places like us um, in the country. And that, in a world where the problems are solved by interdisciplinary teams, that is a huge competitive advantage and one we have and one we will continue um, to take advantage of. Um, I'm here because I think the University of Utah is really positioned to change how to advance how medicine, how science and education are practiced um, in our country. Um, you've heard some of the accolades. President Watkins talked about nine years uh, uh, top ten quality. That's on the inpatient. The outpatient national rankings have only been around for four years, but we're number five nationally in ambulatory care. I just, <laughs> from my prior 30 years on the, on the southeast peninsula there, uh, we were always watching Utah and saying, this is impressive, and um, even sending spies up here to figure out what Utah was doing. Utah, University of Utah Health delivers world-class care up there with the likes uh, of Mayo and other great institutions. You've heard about the research. Two-thirds of that happens in the health sciences. A big portion of that happens at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, and these are really um, important uh, endeavors. Um, I guess the uh, looking forward, uh, President Watkins nicely graphed the value that we're delivering in healthcare and the value that we're delivering in education. But our demographics of our state are changing and we cannot, if we sit still, um, that data point will drift the wrong way. Uh, a lot of the in-migration, in, there's a lot of in-migration, the 3,000 residents of our state will become 4,000 in less than 25 years and the segments of that in-migration uh, uh, involve a lot more retirees, and retirees involve a lot more health conditions. So we're going to have to really, uh, that's what I said, kind of lead the nation uh, in our approaches to health care. And similarly, the growing numbers mean we're going to have to really become, we are, but we're going to have to keep moving forward on how we uh, approach cost uh, and value. Um, we know that health care is many things, our health, our health, our health comes from our health care, our genetics, and our social determinants of health. We need to be approaching all of them. But going back to world-class health care, if you look at some of these data, um, the closer you live to a health system, particularly a world-class health system, you actually can see longer years uh, in life, longer longevity, not only longer health, but longer longevity. And so we're working to expand our health system up and down uh, the valley. Um, uh, we've got centers in Farmington and South Jordan. Later next year, uh, we'll open Sugar House. And that in part is, in large part, is to bring care closer uh, to the community where our citizens live, work, and play, but also to help decongest uh, a very crowded um, uh, academic medical center uh, here on the hill. Um, I think you've heard, and I'll just reiterate, told Spence Eccles once said this too, so we'll give Spence credit uh, tonight, let, let him know, Joe, um, that, the, uh, that, uh, that any state pursuing greatness, any state pursuing greatness needs a world-class medical center at, at its nucleus joined by a world-class uh, university. And again, I'm here because I see both the great accomplishments of the past but the really exciting future before us, world-class cancer care, 200 specialties of medicine and, and healthcare disciplines, uh, all right here um, on, on our great university. Um, so I think at that point, I, at this point, I'll, um, <laughs> I'm reminded of the uh, preacher who asked the parishioner, so 
what did you think of my sermon? And uh, the parishioner said, well, your message was really good, but you preached through re three really good stopping points. Um, so to be careful not to preach through the good stopping points, I think I'll pause here, and I think we're going to facilitate some question and answer. So does anybody have any questions so far for President Watkins or our other two? Yes, sir. Yes, you can. Uh, I'm wondering if being uh, part of a Pac-12 now it makes us <coughs> more competitive with other Pac-12 schools. I don't mean just in athletics, but I mean in all the areas. Because it would change, does it change our perspective or our, or our mission or our, our principle, what we're trying to accomplish as far as yeah. being in Pac-12? No question about it. And I'll tell you that every, uh, first of all, we're in partnership with great institutions. So think about the people that are in the Pac-12. Let's just name a few. Stanford. Stanford. Stanford, how about it? Who else? That's a tough one, Stanford. Stanford is a tough one. Washington. USC, Washington, UCLA. Colorado. Colorado, great institutions, right? This is where we want to benchmark. And I will also tell you, we go to recruit students from around the country, and the opportunity that we have to recruit students faculty and staff, because we're part of the Pac-12, has really changed the profile and visibility of the university. There, we'll do events in California. Students will talk about wanting to come to the university because they want to be part of a place that has major athletics at a big scale. I think it really drives up quality in many, many ways. We're now, when we do a comparison, we are looking at where does the U fall among those great institutions. It's a very good thing for us. We talk to faculty all the time that are attracted to the university because of the opportunity. We know that the visibility that sports gets helps us attract students. Everywhere I go, uh, students, faculty, and staff will talk about that. And I could say from a personal example, as a person who came from the Big Ten, uh, there is no way I would have gotten my husband to come here if we hadn't been in the Pac-12. So, for whatever that's worth, it does matter to people. Yeah. Who else? Yes. And isn't it great what Dr. Good said about Sugar House opening? When is Sugar House opening? October 1st. One of the big points of Sugar House is to help take some of that pressure off. The community clinics that are now in Farmington and other places that I can't think of right at the moment, South Jordan. Um, again, not only is it more convenient for the patient, it's way more convenient for the patient. Better access, more parking, easier from home. It also reduces congestion in your neighborhoods and our environment. Better for patients, better for us. Foothill is a nightmare. Please don't blame all that on the university. I, I know Foothill's a nightmare. From a traffic uh, standpoint and a solution going forward, Foothill is probably one of the biggest things that needs a whole community solution. Yeah, and you guys jump right up here too anytime. <laughs> Yeah, um, relatively modest compared to many of our peers. Our undergraduate student population is around 5% international, and that's lowest in the Pac-12, or very close to lowest. Um, our graduate student population, maybe Dan comment on that, is more international. Oh, as I talk about student success, one of the things that we're examining is how we might, in fact, diversify the international population. Uh, as President Watkins said, compared to our peer institutions, we're quite low. Um, if we added another one to 2,000 international students, we'd be closer to the norm of our peer group. Uh, there are many reasons to think about that. Obviously, we're a state institution. Our primary mission is to serve uh, the residents of Utah. But in a global world, the exposure to diverse cultures, uh, languages, histories, it's all about building citizens of the world who understand how to work, 
collaboratively and positively in a diverse context. I mean, that's part of preparing our students is to have them experience that as part of uh, being here at the U. The other thing, back to reputation related to the Pac-12 observation in a different way, is graduates of the U that are a diaspora around the world carry the brand. Uh, and the more they carry the brand, the more there's a virtuous cycle of attracting the best and brightest in the planet here, which is really the definition of what a great public global research university does. It's a global magnet for talent. And the more that we build that virtuous cycle, the more it fuels, fuels the research excellence, the healthcare excellence, the scholarship excellence, and the educational quality and experience, not only for those international students, but for our, our Utah and domestic students as well. A couple other questions? No, so the question is about potentially homeless students. Yes, there are. I'll give you another factoid to drive that point home. That's not just about homelessness, but it's the reason I was talking about the broadening socioeconomic challenges that our student body faces. Our College of Health has surveyed our student body. Sometime in the next month, roughly one-third of our undergraduates will wonder where their next meal is coming from. And that's growing national trend. So um, there are real issues there as we think about the socioeconomic stratification in society, uh, those challenges. I'm, I'm a first-generation college goer. You know, I was a scholarship kid, poor family. And I think, because I've lived through some of those things, just how many challenges our students face. So how we think about the social safety net for first-generation college goers, for people who are struggling, with, yes, with, with housing, with food, with health care, with all of the social services, there are real issues there. I mean, another example of that that we are experiencing that's true pretty much everywhere across the country is there's rising demand in university mental health care services because the stresses that, par that, that students are feeling is rising. There are real issues there, absolutely. And as we think about how we address those, it means not just thinking about what happens in the classroom. It means thinking about how we engage and partner with the community and other services, but what things we need to do to help those students be successful. And that's why, as part of this task force, we're looking at all of those kinds of social services, facilities, support, what would we need to do to not only support the existing student base, but broaden access. And I think one of the, the things that has made the U.S. higher education system such a global magnet is that it has, over the last 60 years, increasingly broadened access. My biggest fear is that we are now at risk of, at the one time, both trying to throw the doors open, but being financially unable to meet the real needs that that student base now has. You're absolutely right. There are real issues there, and I don't know if you yeah, want to Yeah, there's a that. couple of things that the U has done. One is create a food pantry in the student union which has helped a great deal in terms of food insecurity. And then I think uh, we have had a working group on homelessness in students and how the university can help. This is a place where our partners in the community have been remarkable. There is great support in our community and we appreciate that and we need you. These are big societal issues and having the help of caring partners will make a difference. Maybe one more, Do you, I don't know how much time, Sean, before, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. 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 You would. More than half of our undergraduates are working 10 or more hours a week, so a very large number of our students do work. I believe it's about a quarter of our undergraduates, and I know the undergraduate number is a little bit better, that are working more than 30 hours a week. So there's a fair number of our students. Our students have 
among the lowest rates of debt in the country. They are pretty debt averse, and this, in many ways, is very responsible. They'll go to school a year, work a year, go to school a year, work a year, or work their way through, but take a long time. Uh, the economics of that might not, they might be better off to go full time and finish more quickly and get into the job market. Uh, one of the reasons that we are looking at some other tools to help them. But a very, very responsible student group that does work their way through school. And I think strategies to help them, uh, a little bit of work turns out to be positive in predicting school outcomes up to about 15 hours a week. After that, it starts to be too much and too much competition. Yeah. 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 No, and but that was still a lot of hours. I mean, you were a hardworking student if you did that. Yeah. Just sort of quantify what President Watkins said. Average student debt nationally for undergraduates is in twenty some thousands, as I recall. Our student debt's more like eleven or twelve thousand dollars. So, the the trade off is, as she said, um, we're one of the uh, rare institutions that the eight year graduation rate for our students still rises from the six year graduation rates. Most times, most places it plateaus at about that point, and it reflects that work, drop out of school, save some money, go back to school dynamic. It's part of why when I talked about the income share agreement is to try to help those students who are near graduation to get over that hump more quickly so they get out into the workforce. Julie, there must be a health question for Dr. Good. That's right. <laughs> uh, I don't have a health care question. Oh, that's good. A nice endorsement. <laughs> okay. um, so, to help our legislators understand more clearly what is coming and how fast it's coming. I think that, that they're we're rapidly going over the hill where we <coughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have remarkable we have remarkable people at the U working in this area, a, a broad spectrum, from the effects on people's health to innovative sustainable energy solutions and all points in between. On the issue of air quality per se, I think it's pretty likely that these two very wise senior vice presidents are going to think about a one U campus wide initiative that links atmospheric science with some behavioral change, because we've got to have some behavioral change with maybe a pulmonologist or two to really start to have a big voice in air quality and how we make change. I'll let more them than comment. Some, more than yeah. some change. Yeah. You said some. We're, we're rapidly. Help us with that. Speak your voice as a citizen. Your voice matters too. Well, that's certainly where we're looking, as President Watkins said, everything from monitoring air quality to build models that predict future outcomes, whether it be what actually happens to the air uh, and the collateral effects to the healthcare effects. And that's one of those one U2 ideas that we're spending a lot of time talking about now. And I just want to add, it is one of those uh, grand challenges that only an, uh, one U, uh, an integrated system, can bring the multiple uh, experts to the table to uh, attack this from uh, from all from all angles. So we're, um, I, I think that's something you'll see as we enter. Uh, uh, what what do we hope to accomplish in the next, you know, four to five years? Uh, we're we're already starting to plan and plot. Okay, thank you for those great questions. We do have one more presentation. We're dedicated to getting you out of here by eight. So we'll have uh, Robin Burr present, mm -hmm. and she's going to give us here. our uh, construction uh, updates that are, uh, are occurring on campus. Thank you. I'm Robin Burr, and I lead the facilities group, um, planning, design, construction, and now maintenance and operations. And we're actually doing quite a bit on the sustainability front in our own group. And Sam Jensen Augustine here is our sustainability lead on planning, design, and construction. He works with the team in facilities who buys our energy, looks at which buildings are performing poorly and gets them fixed. And we're doing a lot of great things in geothermal and solar and all kinds of stuff like that. 
Okay, so at these meetings, um, what I usually do is just an update on what's going on on campus, what we're building, what we're working on. And this is just a, a quick look at the projects we talked about at our last meeting, which was in October. Um, someone mentioned the uh, women's soccer men's lacrosse team, our uh, stadium. Our 2008 master plan uh, designates the center of campus as green space, both NCAA fields and recreational fields. And so this soccer lacrosse stadium is one more step joining um, McCarthy Track and the uh, Dumkey Softball Stadium. The spring will also be working on some recreational um, soccer type fields. Uh, we have new surface parking going in between Wasatch Drive and Mario Capecchi. We took out about a thousand spaces for projects going on in the last year and we're putting back some of that here. We've opened the north lot, um, north of Eccles Broadcast and the rest will open in the fall. It, I mean, in the spring. It's going very well. Um, it's been a great success and it's been very helpful. Across the top are two healthcare projects, our ambulatory care center and our rehabilitation hospital. You can see those going up on the hill. Um, they are largely replacing space that's now in our old school of medicine, which is slated to come down. We're moving clinics, we're moving hospital units. Uh, we're expanding our rehab hospital and creating the opportunity for really state-of-the-art research and care in that building. So uh, ambulatory care finishes this fall, the rehab hospital early next year. Our guest house expansion, another important part of our campus, we are adding 30 rooms and these are different than our normal hotel rooms. They will have kitchenettes and small living areas and the goal is to cre create spaces where families can stay when they have a patient in the rehab hospital for three weeks or doing bone marrow transplant in the cancer hospital, having come from Idaho or Wyoming. So a great addition to both our campuses. And then our South stu Campus Student Housing. This is uh, a very large project that broke ground last November. It's on the site of the old um, soccer stadium, um, just to the west of Marriott Honors. It's starting to create a nice housing quad with Lassonde and Marriott Honors and 992 new beds. So that will complete in the summer of 2020, just in time for the opening of school in 2020. So projects we're gonna talk about this time, I think relevant to some of the questions. We're starting um, a really interesting mobility hub or um, transit hub study with a lot of local partners, UTA, UDOT, um, the VA. We'll talk about that. We are, um, getting ready to begin work on the Rice-Eccles um, Stadium South End Zone, show you a bit more about that. And that project is moving to the legislature for approval in the next couple of months. Huntsman Cancer Hospital, we're looking at a phase five of the hospital, and I'm not sure if I have a pointer, but you see up on the hillside picture where phases one, two, three, and four are five is just a little building kind of on the north edge there that tucks itself nicely behind the hill. Um, and then we'll also talk about uh, health sciences um, traffic and parking study that we're embarking on. Um, all, all to address the kind of things that Dr. Good was talking about, that we need to grow and we need to grow responsibly and we need to make sure that um, the experience is good for everyone in terms of access, parking, things like that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Sugar House Health Center, um, which is in that uh, shopping center where 1300 East intersects with Highway 80. You can see it going up there. So all great, interesting projects. First up, our, our stadium. So what this project will do is replace the little tiny 1982 Clark building that you see sitting disconnected at the south end of our stadium. It's a concrete block building. The utilities are really crumbling in the walls right now and we, we really need to you know, fix it so that it's a pleasant experience both for our players and um, the people who come to see our games. In the process, um, we've done a really interesting study, looked across the Pac-12 and other universities at what are, what are the needs of a modern stadium. And so as a result, we are looking at all kinds of different seat types, um, 
club, field level club, a terrace club that looks back at the mountains, all kinds of different amenities that will come with it. But we'll also get good locker rooms and training rooms and recruit space and things like that out of, the, out of it. You can see in the pictures um, how the south end gets closed in, the concourse gets connected, you'll be able to walk all the way around. Um, the scoreboard that we put in a few years ago, we strategically placed for this expansion, so it doesn't move and the south end zone grows around it. Gives us a chance to um, set the Olympic cauldron in a nice place and make room for a new one. So these are just some renderings. You can see a shot from the inside. You can see what the south end zone uh, replacement will look like from the inside with the seats terracing down and a terrace up that looks back to the mountains. Our schedule, we're in the process of approvals. We've been um, all the way through the State Building Board and are, are next queued up for the legislature. Once we finish, we plan to take about a year to do really solid construction documents, uh, finish in April of next year. And then because we have committed to the Athletics Department that we won't lose a football season, We've got nine months for construction. So what we've built in is six months from May through November where we've awarded the construction contracts and we are uh, doing all our shop drawings, all our submittals, all our ordering of materials, prefabrication, everything stored in a warehouse, any kind of make ready work we can do so that as the football team streams out on the last day, that building comes down. Oh, and we plan to be open for the August 2021 season. Okay, next is mobility hubs, and this will address the questions about the growing traffic and what are we doing about Foothill. We spent a lot of time last year talking to Salt Lake City, UDOT, UTA, and the VA as well about our collective needs up on this um, East Bench. Um, everybody has a vested interest in, in, you know, getting this right and making sure we address the long-term needs of getting to the campus, uh, getting from the campus, getting around the campus. So um, we're looking at this notion of mobility hubs or intermodal hubs, and I think this is the picture from Salt Lake City. The idea of a hub is that you bring all different forms of transportation, whether it's active, walking, biking, scootering, buses, shuttles, tracks all together and you create a, a comfortable, easy way to get move from one form of transportation to the other. Um, and uh, the goal obviously is to get people out of single occupancy vehicles to get more people using public and alternative transits, which helps our air quality and helps our traffic, things like that. So we spent a little bit of time last year with all our partners before even thinking about bringing a consultant on about what do we want. So this is kind of a stab at our first, our first blush at what we think needs to happen. And we're thinking about a system of three hubs, one that you see to the east of the stadium that would serve the main campus and the VA. Uh, we're looking at pulling tracks um, out to the south side of the stadium building a hub that the tracks could drive right through. You get off the train in a building and you can switch to a UTA bus or you can get on a shuttle that goes across campus. Then we're looking at another one that would um, open up on Wasatch Drive, so the lower, below Mario Capecchi, that would be the transit hub to serve the health sciences campus. We see that as an opportunity to get off um, tracks, get off a, a bus, um, switch to a shuttle that will take you up or else at least even have an elevator and an overhead bridge to get across to the Health Sciences campus. And then we're thinking about a smaller hub to serve Research Park. We're beginning to think about the future of Research Park as well, um, what we need to do to keep, you know, to reinvest in research and keep that campus alive and growing. So all exciting things. A bit about our timeline, as I mentioned, we spent quite a bit of time last year meeting with our partners, thinking about what needs to happen. Foothill Drive is on the menu as one of those things that either needs to be widened, have bus rapid transit, have tracks go down it. So everything is up in the air for Foothill Drive, but it's, it's on our list to, to take care of. We've got an RFP written to go out and hire a consultant to help us. Um, now think through the study with some professional consulting help. 
we're just in the final stages of getting all the partner agencies to sign the contracts that commit funds because we're all putting in money. Everybody's contributing equally to this study. And then our goal is to spend this year making our plan and the next few years making it come alive. Okay, here's our Sugar House Health Center. A few people have talked about it, what an exciting opportunity is. Um, we have a couple of our partners from um, the Huntsman Cancer Institute who can answer questions that I can't. But this is a five-story, 170,000 square foot building. And it's going to have urgent care, which is often a way to keep people out of the emergency room in the middle of the night um, unnecessarily for a child with an ear infection, things like that. So urgent care in the community is a great way to address uh, traffic on campus. Um, Huntsman Cancer Institute will be putting um, radiation oncology, um, their chemotherapy services here. So all the functions that are not inpatient will be moving to Sugar House. So bringing services to people in a lot more accessible way. And then a whole um, list of all the other kind of um, primary care and specialty care. So this building, you can see the construction shot. It's well on its way and opens in October. A little bit about our uh, another thing we're working on. Um, many people mention the concern about uh, hospitals and clinics and how challenging it is to get there. So um, a couple of months ago, we hired a traffic consultant, Farron Piers, who is helping us with a parking and traffic study specifically related to the health sciences campus. So they are just getting on board and um, starting to work with us on surveys. They'll be out uh, surveying people as they come in the door to figure out if they're a patient, faculty, or staff, how they get here, why they drive, if they drive, why they use tracks, what other forms of transportation they would use. They'll be surveying traffic patterns to figure out. We all probably could tell them where the problems are, but to have documented information about where our issues are. They'll be looking at our master planning and helping us think through what the needs are for parking and what the potential is for um, use of other forms of transportation. And this will tie into our mobility hub study too because they are actually quite linked. Um, they'll also be, we're, we're taking a special hard look at the approach to, to the hospital and to Huntsman Cancer Hospital as you come up, turn from Mario Capecchi up to that North Campus Drive, we know we've got a lot of troubles there and um, this is gonna be our opportunity to start sorting traffic and figuring out how to route it appropriately. So we're very excited about this opportunity. Okay. Um, now to talk a little bit about um, our second project, which is in front of the legislature this season, which is um, Huntsman Phase 5, which is an expansion of our cancer hospital. So these are a couple of shots of what the hospital will look like next to the existing hospital. And um, when you design a hospital, typically the, form, the shape of the, the inpatient unit dictates the shape of the building, and that's why... Um, you see the little study of the inpatient unit. Um, I think this is the option we're aiming toward, which is kind of triangular, which is very efficient, and beginning to drive the shape of the building below. But this building is going to have 50 beds, and they're going to be bone marrow transplant beds, which is a pretty long length, a few weeks length of stay. So these are patients who need to be in an inpatient hospital and need to be there for quite some time. Um, faculty and physician offices. Um, we have a lot of people to get out of the old school of medicine and some of the ones who do work in the uh, cancer hospital will be moving into Huntsman. Um, women's clinic services, expanded wellness services, and endoscopy services. Um, okay. So our schedule. Um, we are in programming now. We're awaiting legislative approval. As soon as we receive it, 1st of April, we'll go very quickly into design with the goal of being in the ground by December of this year. So we'll be designing in a few bid packages, get the first package out and start working on the site work and foundations and then move our way to um, 
foundations and structure and then build out. Um, our goal is to open in September of 2022. This is Ben's request. It's an aggressive schedule, but we're all in. A couple of a uh, couple of other images of the building that are just, as I said, we're just programming. So the architect is interviewing everyone to try to figure out what the space needs are, what the adjacencies are. But um, we're beginning to study the shape of the building and the form of the building as it attaches to the existing hospital. And it's meant to be, it will be beautiful as every Huntsman building is, and it should tuck nicely into the building. So. And that's it for me. Questions for me or for, yes. Well, I think it's zero so far. So to we, we agree completely with you that we need to make it going to our health sciences campus a great experience for everyone and for everyone in the neighborhood. We have seen the study that um, the city of Salt Lake did and UTA and UDOT on Foothill and um, that is part of the impetus for the work we're doing. We obviously don't control Foothill. Um, we can't go widen Foothill and, and run bus rapid transit up it. But what we can do is we can actually, we're not trying to restudy what they've studied already. We're trying to actually create a connection to that study. And um, I believe they're very serious about the study that was done and the findings and the decisions and the changing Foothill to be a better experience. And what we're doing is actually connecting to the work they're doing and, and creating a partnership where we work on it together. We won't fix Foothill, but what we will do is if UTA can start running rapid buses up Foothill, we will create a place where that bus can empty out and people can get easily to the VA or to other areas of the campus. The goal being that if we can solve the problem at our end with these hubs and with our shuttles and with the system on our campus, we, we can also get people out of single occupancy vehicles coming up Foothill because we've provided a better experience upon arrival here and also a way to get from the hub to their place of work. It's all very I, I mm -hmm. Yeah. They are expensive and they take time and to widen Foothill will be a 
20-year nightmare, I think, because there's not too much place to go without some processes. But we're seeing this uh, partnership as actually an opportunity to go after federal funding. UTA has grant money. There are, there are pockets of money, and we think by having all these agencies working together, we have a better opportunity of, of getting the funding to start taking these steps. So um, we're trying, yes. And to your question, of your statement about we shouldn't build until we fix, in a perfect, no, in a perfect world, you know, I, I completely understand your, the emotion behind it. Since that's not humanly possible and we need to create beds where, you know, connected to our existing hospitals, we're trying to do other things to mitigate the traffic, like moving 170,000 square feet of care to Sugar House, things like that. Um, and, and start to focus the inpatient things which don't drive those in and out cars. You know, the, the traffic in a medical center is from 15 minute patient appointments or coming to the lab or going to the pharmacy. Hospitals don't drive that constant in and out. So it's a better place for our inpatient services and it's better to get our outpatient ones out into the community. Right. I'd heard about that. It was lost before I got here, I'd, but many people have mentioned it to me, so we'll look into that. We're also hoping that the guest house expansion, it's a... Yeah. Right. No, I think that's a great suggestion. We'll look into it, definitely. Thank you. Other questions? I'm, I'm kind of on the, on the parking vehicle thing, too, but from a non-medical standpoint, of view, uh, staff, you know, every day, and I'm sure you're looking at it, but why do we build more surface parking? Why do we build more parking? If we didn't have parking places, wouldn't people be more likely to get on mass transit? We, we have that debate. Uh, amongst ourselves, um, between the people who care for the students and our, you know, we have a very big sustainability team on campus that is trying to do the right thing every day. And I think there are camps of people who say, just take away the thousand spaces and they'll figure it out. But our feeling is that we have to give people warning before we take away. We have to say, you know, you, not just tomorrow. I mean, we took out a thousand spots this past year and it created some mayhem. So we're putting ones back that we can. We're looking for the balance. We agree with you that we, we, need, to, we need to make the transit work better before people will get out of their car. And, you know, maybe it's a chicken and egg. Yeah. Let, let them find the way. And, and I'm, it's also part of it. I just hate it to see parking go on that hill. Well, so... Yeah, and we we were unsure about it as well. What's good about it is that it's terraced into the hill and it's kind of nice. The other thing I'll say is that I showed a slide that showed our center green campus space. We're not really taking away grass, we're relocating it. What we've basically done is we're making a green space in the center. The, we're taking out parking lots and turning them into play fields. And for now, we're relocating the parking up the hill. It's not ideal. We all agree with you that it would be better if we had less cars. We need to find a way so that it doesn't cause a crisis. It needs to have a plan and some alternative forms of transportation and tracks trains that aren't so overloaded that people can't get on them at rush hour. So we agree that's our goal and we're working on how to get there as part of all of this study. So we don't want to pave our campus over either. So. 
Uh, at this point, nothing. Um, stadium parking. You know, I wasn't here when that was studied before. Uh, we pick it up and dust it off and look at it every once in a while. Right now, it's not on. It's not in our master plan to do. Um, it, it, you know, there are a lot of good things about it too. Um, well, density. Another thing we talk about is our and how we how we touch the community. It becomes an opportunity to bring a little bit of retail on our campus edge and to blend better with the community. So um, I would say it's not on our plan going forward right now. It is something we still continue to look at. But whatever we do, we'll have community participation again. So absolutely, you're welcome to call me. I'm sure I don't know everything because I wasn't here. OK, Sean says I have to be quiet. We're trying to do our best to get you out of here by 8. So thank you all for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me. Um, is, my email address is sean, S-H-A-W-N, dot wood, at utah.edu. On the table, the sign-in table as you came in, I have uh, two stacks of business cards. So take those, contact me at any time if you have any questions or concerns. I'll do my very best to reply to you quickly and get an answer for you. So um, thank you for coming. Have a great night. Drive safely.